thank you for giving the opportunity to talk here at Microsoft. So I'm a PhD student of Emnita and Clément Pellegrini yes, in Toulouse, in France. I'm working on quantum information and I would say quantum marginal problems. And today we talk about this quantum cloning problem and more specifically the universal, I mean, um, or we want to clone all pure states and asymmetric, we want the, the clone, the copy to be maybe different. And so what is it? I think the, the history of the quantum cloning theorem and the no cloning theorem come from this, this protocol, this flash protocol, so first light amplification superluminal hookup, which is a, a superluminal um, communication. So not possible, but it was probably not clear at that time. And so the protocol is uh, like this. So we have two people, Alice and Bob, and a common source. And in this common source, we have this, this state, say, and then we um, the, the source send a qubit. So the common source has a, a notable qubit. And it's a qubit row A to Alice, and a qubit row, row B to Bob. And then Alice can decide to do a measurement following the, the Z operator, the only uh, Z uh, operator. And if Alice do so, the Bob states become this one half of the, um, the state zero plus the state one. And if Alice decided to do the measurement on the poly uh, X operator, then the state of Bob become this one half of the state plus in the computational basis, plus in state minus. But it is well known that in both case, it is the one half identity, so maximally mixed states in the Bob side. So there is no way for Bob to distinguish between the two measures of Alice. So we cannot exchange <laughs> information with this. So Herbert had this idea. He said, okay, um, but he distinguished two kinds of measurements, one leaving the measured state in the against state of the measure again value, a second one leaving the measured state in some other again state. Okay, so let's make a third kind of measurement, one that duplicates the measured state exactly. So let's do the protocol again and, and do this. So we have the common source. We send a qubit to Alice and a qubit to Bob. And then Bob do this third kind of measurement. It duplicates exactly the state. And then again, Alice decides to measure the Pauli Z operator. And the state of Bob, with the two copies, become one half of state zero, zero plus one half of state one, one. And if Alice measure following the poly X operator, it become one half of plus plus and minus minus. But now the two states are different. So Bob can distinguish between the two measures of Alice without any classical communication. So it's not like the quantum teleportation protocol. So we can decide, okay, we have this common state psi, and then we send one qubit to Alice, one qubit to Bob. And at some point, Alice will measure. And maybe like one second later, Bob will also measure the states and can decide if Alice has done the first or the second measurement. So basically, this is a bit of information that can be sent in a superluminal way. So of course, this is not possible. And so the answer of this of this paper and this protocol was basically the no cloning theorem. And in the modern uh, language, it's said like this. So there is no quantum channel from one qubit to two qubits, such that for all pure states, it's only on pure states the output of the quantum channel uh, on this qubit is a um, two copy, two exact copy of this state. And you can um, generalize this for any local dimension. So there is no quantum channel from one qubit to two qubits, such that the output is exactly two copy. But what we can do also is we can ask, um, can we get more outputs if we have more inputs? So for example, I decide to get m input, and I want n output. So of course, n to be larger than m. And again, the, the theorem is no. There is no quantum channel from m qubit to n qubit with n larger than m, such that for all pure states, if I take exactly m copy of the input, I get exactly n output. And this is not possible. So basically. Um, Yes, when um, this is 
yes, maybe a limitation of quantum information, but a good or bad, I don't know. But when information is encoded in the quantum system, we cannot copy it, clone it. Uh, it's also a limitation of probability. Yes, and so But there is also an advantage of this that if you send um, a quantum state, a quantum pure state to someone, and if at the end um, uh, the, the qubit uh, come an actor red, then you are sure, I mean, the high probability with some probability, that the state has not been copied. And this is uh, the, the, the key idea of some quantum cryptography protocols. So basically, in classical cryptography, what we want is to find um, a problem which is hard enough to be sure that if someone reads the, the message, the um, encrypted message, then uh, he has to break the, the problem, which is hard. In quantum cryptography, we want to be sure that the message cannot be read. So it's a different approach without any assumption on any problem. Uh, but we can ask also the same thing for mixed state. So previously, the quantum cloning problem was only for pure state. And so what about mixed states? And we have also this no one to two broadcasting problem. So there's no quantum channel from one QD to two QD such for, for all states, not pure, not necessarily pure. Uh, and for all marginal of this channel, I, phi I of the input is equal to the output. So here we look only on the local outputs and we want the local outputs to be equal to the inputs. Uh, and this can be generalized for any number of outputs. So of course, if you cannot broadcast two, uh, up to two states, you can broadcast n states. And you can say, okay, maybe there is also this no m to n broadcasting theorem. And the answer is no. So if you have more than one single input, you can find a broadcasting uh, channel, which is surprising, at least for me. And so this is called the super broadcasting theorem. Uh, on qubits, it's like this. So I take rho, a qubit, so in the block, in the block sphere, not necessarily pure, and I write r, the, the block vector, basically the direction in, in the sphere. So rho uh, becomes like this. We have these two first results, very simple. We know that the state is actually pure if the block vector r is a um, unit, the number of these vectors is one. And then we know also that if the two qubits commute, then their block vector are correct. So basically they are in the same direction in the, the block sphere, but maybe in the opposite, but I mean, they are parallel. What do you mean by qubits commute, like the density matrices? Yes. So rho is always now density matrices. So it's also in the broadcasting, the zone is that you can have a big bounce. Yes, yeah, exactly. But we just look uh, local and local outputs. We want all the local outputs to be equal to. And so, yes, this is like a local output. You mean you trace out everything else? Everything else, like, except one. And we want this for all the marginal of the quantum. And so, this super broadcasting theorem said that for M, the number of inputs greater or equal than four, actually, there exists a, a quantum channel from M state to N states. So, N is larger than M and dependent on M, such that for all pure states, with a small block vector, of course, because we know that when the block vector is one, the norm is one, it's pure state and we have the no clinic theorem. So here the norm, the, the, the block vector should be small. So for all states with a small block vector and for all marginal, the marginal of this quantum channel with M exactly, uh, exact copy of the inputs, the, the result of this, the state rho prime commutes with rho, so it is in the same, uh, direction in the block sphere, so basically the same state. And actually, the, um, the, um, the block vector of this state is larger. So it means that it encodes the same information, more or less, and it's more pure. So it goes both things at the same time. Yes. And so this, this radius, like the board, is so small that all the states in there are separable, or is there actually still some things? Um, no, we. Mm, I'm not sure. This 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 length depends on M also. And so if you have a big M, I mean basically the, the air can grow up to not one, but it's just one cube, isn't it? 
Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, so they're just one different to look at. Yeah, yeah, also, yeah. But yeah, I mean, the, the, this, this model of block vector length can be large for large n. And so if you have, um, I think I, I can remember when it was n equals seven, you can get arbitrary number of outputs. Like this, this top two norm inequality, why does this have anything to do with log prime being similar to log? Uh, this one? Yes. Uh, this one means that the, the row prime is more pure than row. And they commute, so they are similar. They are, sim they are in the same direction the blocks fare. Get, get zero and get one compute in your previous. Um, yes. Mm. Yes, sorry. They are not similar in the sense, yes. They, they are similar in the sense that they are in the same direction in the block sphere, but not, they are not the same states. So is it that your block has to be the basis, not the state or something? No, no, you are broadcasting the state, yes. No, but what we're not saying that it could be any direction. Yes, and it can also be in the opposite direction in the sphere. So it's, it's not like the perfect, Broadcast, of course, but we have, we have this relation that the commutes and it's more pure. So basically, what does it mean that from fewer and noisier copy, you can get more copy and more pure? Which is a little bit counterintuitive, but of course, because we are looking at the broadcasting prime where we look only at local um, local states for the outputs. Um, the amount of information is, is not bigger. I mean, the, the, the big output state is correlated and you just trace on everything except one. So it's not surprising. It's just because we, we are looking at local states that we have this, this property, but the, the big output state is, is, is correlated. But ju just, just to mean that the no cloning theorem is not true when we look at the broadcaster. Where's, where's the coding here? Like, it's not at all clear that those, <laughs> those, those states that you get out are in any way copies or even similar to the original states. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but if you look at the fidelity between the output and the input, so maybe this flipping actually never happens. The parallel actually is in the same direction. Although you need that flipping to see that. Nah, it can happen. It can happen. Uh, Let me say again, in what way the output states are copies of the input I mean, in the sense that they are saying that it's copy because it's commutes, basically. But oh, it's, it's, yes, uh, uh, it's the same direction up to a, a, a minus one sign. But it's not exactly the same state, of course. Yeah, but then I guess you're kind of broadcasting like a direction or like a line, not uh, not a specific, like not a, not a ray, but a line. That's exactly, yes. <laughs> It's not exactly the broadcasting, but we have these properties. Um, okay, so so what can we do? Now we go back to cloning, so only pure states. And we know that we have the no cloning theorem, so maybe we can ask for an optimization problem. So what we want is this. We want a quantum channel from one state to n states, such that for all marginal i, and for all pure states, so it's cloning. The output, the local output, so the output of the marginal is equal to the input. So this is not possible. So what we can ask is the, the output of the marginal to be the input with some probabilities. And y minus this probability, the maximally mixed state. So maximally mixed state is a state that maximizes um, the entropy. So basically, it's the worst copy that we can ask. Um, and also, so this is. Um, the universal, universal symmetric quantum cloning optimization prime. And maybe you can ask the probability to be different for each marginal, and this become asymmetric. And so at the end, um, the set we are looking is this isotropic set. So it's a set of probabilities such that it exists a cloning map, so a quantum channel from one to n states, such that for all marginal and per states, the output of the marginal is 
this probability for this marginal of the input plus one minus probability uh, of the maximum mixed things. So this is a set of all probabilities, but maybe you can ask the, the, the best one we are interested in, actually in the best cloning map, not just any cloning map. But for, to define the best cloning map, we need um, to decide in which direction we want to clone. So maybe we want the first copy to be better than the second one by factor two, and the second one to be better than the third one. So we need to decide the direction of the, of the cloning. And for, for that, I define this direction vector alpha, which is just a vector in the direction between zero and one, that sums one. And then the, the optimization prime, the first one, the worst one, is I take the best quantum channel such that for all um, pure states, I take the worst one of the fidelity, the quantum fidelity between these states and the output of the, of the marginal i of this channel on, the, on rho. And then I sum with this direction vector. So the best cloning map such that for the, the worst pure state have this fidelity and with this direction vector. Yes. Why do you wait the process to sum of alpha i is equal to one? Uh, just for normalization. I mean, like, yes, like you don't need to measure that you have a perfect copy. You don't need to have alpha one is equal to, I mean, you want to have one and one plus one alpha i. So this is not physical, but maybe you can try to. Yes, I mean, I mean if you put alpha equal one and one, it's the same as alpha for one alpha, one alpha for the optimization for alpha. Uh -huh. yeah. Just for the normalization, I'll put this. But yes, we, you, maybe you don't need this. Yeah, I guess your quantity you define is going to be at most one. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's what I want, but yes. Because the potentiality is between zero and one. <coughs> but yes, this is not really useful. So this is the worst because we take the worst pure state and we can define the average, which is the same problem, but this time we take the average or the, the pure state. Would you, would you say that it's not worse to get identity over D, but identity minus rho? Identity. Because now you have the fidelity is always, it won't be zero, right? Because the identity matrix should be symmetric. Yeah. I guess fidelity is good. Yes. Can you get some, you're saying it's worse to get the identity matrix with this minus D, but you still have some overlap with the original state and identity matrix. I mean, probably it just rescales. No, no, I mean, here there is no identity. The identity was just here. Here, I just defined this over all the quantum channel. So, so this is saying that this quantity cannot be zero. It, it's, it has like half or some kind of value. This, this value? Yeah, yeah so it will never be zero. Yes. I mean, we got, yes, we have an equation for, for this. Uh, yes, it will not never be zero. Okay, so the, the, the first result that we have is that for any, any direction vector alpha, the two optimization problem worst and average are actually equal. So if you look at the, the worst pure state or the average of the pure states, um, the result of the optimization problem are the same. And if we take the, the optimal quantum channel for the worst of the average, they are the same problem. Then this quantum channel is a quantum channel and in the isotopic sets, so uh, the marginal are in this form. So basically the three definition are not equivalent, but I mean, they are related. The two optimization problem are equivalent and the optimal map for the average of the worst are like this. So if you look at the isotopic sets, we have everything. We have the optimal one and any cloning map. So what were the, the previous results? The first one for, was for the, the symmetric case. So um, the optimal quantum channel map for the worst or the, or the average when the, the direction vector is uniform, so it means that all the copy should be equal, is this one. So this uh, phi uh, opt and phi opt of rho for any pure state rho is very simple actually. You take your input rho, tensor with the identity with uh, on n minus one uh, system to get a state on n system. And then you conjugate by this P plus SN, which is just the projector of the symmetric subspace. So you want the output to be in the symmetric subspace because we are looking on the symmetric cloning map and just project it. And then you have a, a small uh, normalization problem. Cool, cool. 
decryption hypothesis. And so we know because of the last theorem that the marginal of this of this channel is actually of the form phi opt of i of rho is some probability p opt of the input of the input plus one minus p opt of the maximally mixed state. And this probability depends, of course, of n and d. And for example, when you want two copies of qubits, it's two thirds. So the probability is not that bad. But again, this is the probability of just a local state. It's not, uh, I mean, the, the full output state is correlated. So when you look at local states, it seems that it's good, but actually it's not that good. So where are you going to this? Because there's a, but I guess you are touching a maximally mixed state, right? So there's like n minus one copy, but this identity should be known. Right. No, I mean we normalize it here, but okay. so somehow this this normalization factor is fixed. Yes, exactly. Um, and we know also the previous result for the asymmetric case. So for any direction vector, was this one? We know less on this. So we know that the optimal isotropic set. So optimal isotropic set means the set of probabilities corresponding to an optimal cloning map for the worst or other average prime. So we take a direction vector, look at the best quantum channel for this prime, this optimization prime. We know because of the first theorem that it is a quantum channel with marginal equal to probability of the input plus one minus probability of the elasticity, and we take this probability. And we know that this probability must satisfy this equation. Okay, quite simple equation, but then comes to question, um, is any probability satisfying this equation optimal? And is an um, isotropic uh, set, the full set, the convex full of this equation, maybe with the vector zero? So we want to understand if this equation character is basically the isotropic set. And um, surprising, the, surprising that the answer to this two question is actually no. And so why? So if we look at the one to two, so two clone optimal isotropic sets from the previous equation for some local dimension, we have these this, this, this plots and nothing is wrong here. If, if we set the first probability to be zero, then the second probability is one. So basically you have one input and you send this input to the second output and the identity on the first one. And you can do the same thing for probability P2 equals zero and P1 equal one. And then we have this, this uh, not, not a, a linear combination of this in between can do better. So basically if we want P1 equal P2, we have the two third here on the symmetric optimal cloning map. So there is nothing wrong here, but if we look at the one to three optimal isotopic sets, then something is strange. So the, the, this set is a, a 3D set, the one to three optimal isotropic sets and we'll take a slice we'll take a 2d slice of it the slice where the last two priorities are equal so i want the set of priority in this set so the last two are equal so what we know is that when the first priority is zero basically what we're asking is the best cloning map that send the identity on the first marginal and two copies the best one on the second one so this is basically the one to two optimal symmetric quantum cloning problem. And so we know that the, these points, zero to third to third, must be in the isotropic set for the qubit case. So we'll see if, the, if, the, if this point is in this set also. So this is the set one to three optimal isotropic sets when the two last priorities are equal. And in red, it's just the two third optimal symmetric case on two copies. So it seems that we reach the two thirds or so nothing wrong here, but if we zoom a little bit, <laughs> actually, <laughs> what we have is that when the first probability is zero, so we send the identity on the first clone, what we get is something smaller than two thirds. So the, this equation does not characterize the optimal isotopic set because we are missing this point and we are missing all the points here. We know that this point should be in the isotopic set because it's just the restriction of the three clones to two clones. But it is not in this 
in this blue plot, so it's not in the, in the equation. So there's something missing with this equation, and we cannot calculate the full isotopic sets. So what we did is to, to characterize these sets, we define a norm, a Q norm on Rn. And so the Q norm of a vector x on Rn is defined as d, so the norm defined d, of a lambda max, we'll say what is it, minus the one norm of x divided by d square minus one. And this lambda max, what is it? It's just the, the largest second value of an operator Sx, an operator on Md tensor n plus one. And this operator Sx is the sum over i of the absolute value of xi of the omega zero i. So omega is the unnormalized and maximally integral states between the first zero and subsystem i. And we had tensor um, identity on the rest side of t on the n minus one. So this is an operator. I take the largest second value of this and I have a norm. So first it's not obvious that this thing is a norm because we are removing a, a one norm. But actually it is a norm. And the isotropic sets is um, a set of probability or positive probability. So it's the, the negative part of a unit ball of a norm and which norm? Not this one, but the dual of this one. So we take this norm, we look at the dual, we look at the unit ball, we take the non-negative part, it is exactly the isotropic set. So this is the first result. And the second result um, express the cloning map, the optimal cloning map using permutation operator. So what is a permutation operator? We take the D to the K dimensional uh, tensor space CD tensor K. And we said that uh, the symmetric group on K elements, so the, the group of permutation of K elements, acts on this space by permitting the tensor. So more precisely, if you take a permutation sigma on the permutation group of K element, you define its, its action on this tensor space, you define it on rank one tensor, V1 tensor, V2 up to K, by permitting the tensor, basically. So this is this as a permutation operator. We extend this linearly to get a production. And so for example, if you look at the projector into the symmetric subspace, which was used in the optimal symmetric quantum cleaning frame, this is just the sum of all the permutation of SK on the permutation as an operator acting on the tensor space, tensor space a divide, a divide, multiplied by a normalization coefficient, so one divided by a factor in K. And so the result is that the optimal quantum um, cloning problem for any direction vector alpha and for the worst or average um, optimization problem is this one. So it looks like the same. So it's the, this phi opt alpha of rho and phi opt alpha of rho is just rho to so identity on n minus one system. And you conjugate by this p alpha of Sn. Now it's not a product anymore. But P alpha of Sn is just one over factorial F n of the sum of all the permutation in the symmetric group on n elements of the permutation and with some scar on photopins. Is the normalization also a big alpha divided by trace? Yeah. Uh, basically, the normalization of the alpha will be here. We put the normalization into this. So, okay, so um, how, how to do this? Um, the first thing we can see is that um, for quantum channel from one state to n state, we can define the symmetrized quantum channel uh, phi tilde by doing this integral over the unitary group of un of u tensor n of the, the channel inside u, u star or u and outside um, u star to the n. So basically we conjugate inside and outside by the unitary with the correct number of system. And this defines a quantum channel, a symmetrized quantum channel. And because the quantum fidelity is actually concave, and jointly concave actually, for all two states and for all marginal, the quantum fidelity between any two states and the symmetrized quantum channel on this marginal, this is greater, and it's what we want, 
of the same thing, but with the quantum channel not symmetrized. So basically, it means that if you want to solve the optimization problem worst or average, you can look only at symmetrized quantum channel because the quantum fidelity is already there. So we'll do this. We'll consider now the worst and average problem uh, on symmetrized quantum channel. And then if you look at the marginal of such symmetrized quantum channel, they're actually the debarizing channel. So on, on rho is equal to some probability of rho plus one minus this probability of the identity. So this is basically the, res the first result of the theorem. Um, the optimal um, cloning map for the optimization problem are the same as the one in the isotropic set. Uh, but we can do also this. If you look at the fidelity of an output of such a marginal on any pure state rho, the fidelity does not depend on rho because it is a depolarizing channel. So basically, the fidelity does not depend on the states. And if we take the average over the pure state or the worst pure states, it is the same. So the worst and the average optimization prime are equal because of this. Okay, so now um, I just recall the definition of the Chern matrix. So the Chern matrix for linear map T from MD to MD prime is um, the identity on system D, also this linear map, and we give to this this omega, so the unnormalized maximum of states. And from the Chern matrix, we can get back the linear map by doing the partial trace on D of the Chern matrix of the inputs transposed on the identity on the prime. And we have this famous um, result that the linear map is actually completely positive mm -hmm. if the Chern matrix is positive as a matrix and trace preserving if this partial trace condition holds. Oh, sorry, if you maybe uh, go back two slides, uh, I didn't understand why. It, it did make a difference, but it increased the fidelity. And because we want to, to get the max on the optimization prime, this is always better. And the consequence on this is that the fidelity actually does not depend on the state. And so taking the, the infimum of the pure state or the average of the, of the pure state is the same. It does not depend on the pure state. Okay, so can we get an upper bound on the average or the worst of the same optimization problem? Yes, we can take, for example, the average one. So the definition of the optimization problem is this one. The best quantum channel symmetrized, the sum over i of the direction vector i of the average of the pure state of this fidelity. And because uh, we are taking the average of the pure states, the fidelity is just a trace. Um, and now we can transform the marginal phi i into the Choi matrix. So if we have this thing, take the average of the pure state of the trace of the Choi matrix of phi of row transpose. So this is to get um, the output of the Choi uh, of the quantum channel, row transpose, tensor row i. So row i is row on the subsystem i. This is to get the trace with this and the marginal i. And we add identity on the rest. And now we need to take this average. The first thing you can see is that inside the trace, the average is over the pure state. So we are only looking at row transpose tensor row e, row i. And this is the same as taking the average of our row transpose tensor rho, and then putting the second system on system i. And this is the same as taking the average of rho tensor rho, and then the partial transpose on the first one. And the average of rho tensor rho is just the identity plus flip with a good normalization. And then we need to take the partial transpose of the first one. So the partial transpose identity is identity. And the partial transpose of flip is the unnormalized maximum integral state. So at, at the end, what we have is in the sum inside the trace, the trace of the joy matrix, sum alpha i, the result of the average, so identity on two space between zero and i, and omega between zero and i, at the side entity on the rest. And this, this sum, we'll call it r alpha. So this is just 
a big, uh, a big matrix. Um, and because this matrix is emission and the Troy matrix of the quantum channel is positive, the upper bound is just to take the lambda max of this matrix. Like, can you actually compute this lambda max? This is the rest of the function. It's <laughs> this is not easy. Not easy. Did you say that here you can take the top loss of generating the part to be a symmetric one? Uh, yeah, so basically, here we, we took only symmetrized quantum channel. And so it means that the, the marginal are so in the almost in the topics. Yeah, and then can you just use that the fidelity has this independence on the pure state? And then you find a problem that actually depends on the probabilities that you choose? Um, yes. But I mean, we will get an upper bound on the probability, but we don't know which one. I mean, if we do this here, we'll get uh, something that depends on the probability of phi, mm -hmm. but we don't know what it is. This is exactly what we want to find. I mean, we want the best one. Mm -hmm. So basically, we we'll get a, a, a sub of the probability of some function of the probability. But I mean, we, we want to find the probability, so we should not do this if we want to, to find which one is the best one. Or maybe there's another way to do it, but I mean, we, we try with this metric because this, this matrix alpha does not depend on the choice matrix, independent of the choice matrix. So it, it is independent on, on this. So now we have an upper bound that does not depend on any choice of cloning map. Like, so in your expression, why do you have this identity under a minus one there? Yeah, so basically this is a, this identity. But here, D prime is um, uh, uh, in space. Uh, and because I have this rule I, I will move one, one space and then start with this. Okay, but the channel has outputs, like it has N systems. So. Yes. Um, but. So shouldn't there be a big state of N systems? Because. Yes, but I'm putting also this 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 row i because I, I want the, the fidelity between row and the marginal i. So if I if I remove this and I put n, then I have just the trace of the output of the quantum channel. But I don't want the trace of the output. I want the marginal i. Right. So I put the, the the row i here. I remove one identity. I take the trace. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So now you are going to show an upper bound for this thing using this idea, and then you are going to show that you can have this upper bound using probabilities. Yes, exactly. And it's super difficult to show that you can have that upper bound in using the direct probabilities. But the, this matrix are alpha, so this one, the sum, mm -hmm. it's almost the same as the, the matrix S X, the matrix S X was this one, but without the identity here. But because we are looking at the lambda max, I mean, the identity will just have a shift on the, on the largest by eigenvalue. So basically, if we want to find this lambda max, we can find a largest eigenvector for this matrix. And this is the same as finding the largest eigenvector for the matrix S alpha, so without the identity. Because the alpha are positive, we don't take that field value here. But the question was after one with D, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, with in the previous before the inequality. So yes, if there is one over D times T plus one. Yes. And one over D went into the definition of this matrix. We take from the definition of the average. Uh -huh. I mean like in the inequality? Yes. There's no D factor, right? No, no, because you take the, the trace of the tree matrix. Ah, okay, I see. And so because of this, you know, yeah. the trace of the tree matrix will be. Yeah, okay. So at the end, what we want is find a, a larger second vector for this big matrix, which is not easy, but okay. So first, the maximally integral states on normalized omega is just a transposition in the symmetric group between the first and the second element, seen as an operator acting on the dust space 
with a partial transpose on it. Uh, and so we can rewrite this matrix S alpha as the sum of alpha i of the transposition between zero and i with a partial uh, transpose on the first system. This is an equivalent definition. And then because we want the, the larger second vector of this, we are interesting in the image and the kernel of this thing. So if we take um, any vector v in the space cd tensor n minus one, then for all i and for all j, this uh, transpose between zero and i with a partial uh, transposition um, applied to the omega unnormalized maximum integral state, but as a pure state between zero and j tensor, this vector, which can be any one, is actually if i equal j, the same vector, but with a factor d, and if i is different than j, then it is this unnormalized maximum integral state as a pure vector between zero and j tensor the vector v with some permutation, which is a cycle in this group and quite complicated. But at the end, we get the same thing. So we can deduce this result that we have the, the following inclusion of image and kernel for the operator S alpha. So the image of S alpha is contained in the spin of the calligraphic V and which is used a set of all the normalized maximum integral state as pure state between zero and I for all I. So, so uh, the vector V for all vector V. And the kernel of this contain the orthogonal complement of this set. Okay, so now we know more or less what is the image in the kernel, but we are looking at all V and V is a lives on a big space. So maybe you can do something better like decomposing the space. And so for this, we'll do a, this space decomposition. So we take this, this tensor space and we decompose it into orthogonal sum of irreducible representation of a symmetric group. So it's not really important to understand exactly what are these um, uh, space and become multiplicity or not. We know how to decompose this. So now we have an orthogonal sum of this big space and we can define uh, for all indices of this orthogonal sum, uh, the, the space capital uh, V lambda, which is just the unnormalized maximum integral state as pure state between zero and I for all I, so, so V for uh, V that lies on this substrate. And why it is useful to do this? Because we can prove that actually the, the operator as alpha um, can be block diagonalized with respect to this capital uh, V lambda spaces. So basically, if we want to find the largest eigenvector of this, we need to look at individual blocks. Um, and the blocks are quite similar. Sorry, I, I guess maybe to emphasize, like when you need to go one slide back, so you kind of you're using really the symmetric group on n minus one things, yes, as opposed to like a Brouwer algebra where you have like a, you could have like n systems in one system, but you're not doing that. You're just doing exactly. Yes. Okay. Where is the simple? And so the, the result is that the the largest eigenvector is actually in the first blocks, the block that correspond to this v uh, capital v. Uh, Calligraphic V lambda one, which is a trivial representation of the symmetry. Basically, the block is very simple, just alpha i on the row i at an nylon steer on the diagonal. So we need to find the largest eigenvector and get value of this matrix. It's not difficult. Um, and we know that the largest eigenvector of this block is of the form convex combination of the omega zero i tensor of V, which lies in the symmetry subspace. So we have a lot of structure on this. And so for example, if we take um, the two copies um, case, um, what we want is to compute the largest again value of this matrix, which is, uh, we can do this. And we, if we look at the qubit case, um, when the direction vector is uniform, so the symmetric quantum cloning of qubits, then the upper bound is just the, the largest again value of, of um, this matrix with I got divided by three, which is five or six, and it is exactly the result 
of the optimal symmetric quantum cloning map. So basically, this um, number one is actually uh, tight for this case, and it is for all cases actually. Um, so how to saturate this upper bound? Simple. We take the, the largest second vector for the matrix S alpha of, the, of this form, because the V R lies in the symmetric subspace. We have this relation on the coefficient of the convex equilibrium, and then the optimal quantum cloning map for this direction is this one, as in the theorem. But now we can construct the the, the P alpha S N. P alpha S N is just one over factor f n of the sum of all the permutation in the symmetric group of the permutation. And the, and the coefficient now is just the coefficient of the largest again vector. But the index, the indices is the, the permutation on zero plus one for some reason. But we can construct the optimal cloning map for all the direction vector now. Um, and yes, this and the, the the question of the quantum cloning correctly. 